Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Reverend Donald Maynard, and I was the pastor of the Wesleyan Church in the village of Canisteo for 32 years. And out of those 32 years, I've known uh, Nick's family for 20 plus. And they are some of the kindest people that you would ever meet in your life. Today, I want to say, uh, thank you so much for your presence on behalf of Trooper Nicholas Clark and his family for the tremendous outpouring of love you've shown them upon the loss of a son, of a longtime friend, a true hero, and a wonderful human being who has touched so many lives in the short time that he had with us. Now, before we move on, I would like to recognize and say thank you to Governor Andrew Cuomo and the other dignitaries who are here today. Uh, thank you to Superintendent George Beach of the New York State Police. Thank you to Troop E and all of you law enforcement officers who are here and those perhaps could not be here. I know that you feel a tremendous loss over a friend and a colleague. I would also like to thank the Alfred University and the Alfred State College and all of its staff for your kindness and your generosity in allowing us to do this here today. And also to thank the CMI Communications for all of this amazing technology. I was here yesterday through the entire duration of this event, of the calling hours, and I was watching the people and the outpouring of love from the communities and across this nation and in here was so amazing that honestly words couldn't adequately describe or express what we saw. But as we've gathered together to honor Nick's life, I trust that we will find comfort in the fact that God loves each and every one of you this morning. And I also want you to know that he is present with us today as well. Let's bow in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, as we come before you this morning, all of us come with extremely heavy hearts. Because here was a young man who lived so much of a full life in 29 years, and yet it was cut short tragically, doing his duty and being honorable in the law enforcement field. Lord, in my life, in the years I was there, I can remember Nick and a number of these young men who are serving in law enforcement today, they grew up together. I watched them. And today, honestly, personally, Lord, I am so proud of each of them for the contribution they make to society. But I would pray for Nick's parents today and his siblings. Father, comfort them with only the peace that you can give them. May you wrap your arms of love around them, Lord, and that they will sense your holy presence this morning. And I pray for each of us that as we go through this service to honor Nick today, that we're going to hear the word of God and the message that he gave me, that we will share this and listen to it and apply it to our lives. And we thank you in the name of Jesus. Amen. I'd like to read three passages out of scripture this morning. And this I want to direct to my friends, the family. In Isaiah 41.10, it says this, So do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. And then one perhaps we're pretty well familiar with, the 23rd Psalm is one when King David of Israel was going through one of the hardest times of his life. And he was desperate and everything was up against him. And he penned these words, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. And even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. 
The last one is Psalm 39, beginning with verse 4. And this is one that I believe, and I, and I discovered this years ago, that all of us as we're going through life should reflect upon this and really, truly think about it. It says, show me, Lord, my life's end and the number of my days. Let me know how fleeting my life is. You have made my days a mere handbreadth. The span of my years is as nothing before you. Everyone is but a breath, even those who seem secure. Surely everyone goes around like a mere phantom. In vain they rush about, heaping up wealth, without knowing whose it will finally be. But now, Lord, what do I look for? My hope is in you. At this time, I would like to invite the New York State Police Superintendent, George Beach the second to come forward and to share. Good morning. Today we honor the memory of Trooper Nicholas Clark, a well-respected state trooper brother and friend. To Nick's parents, Teresa and Tony, to his brother Nathan. On behalf of the New York State Police, I extend to you our deepest sympathies and condolences. To Governor Andrew Cuomo, our colleagues in law enforcement and public safety, thank you for being here to support the family of Trooper Clark, his friends, and the state police. Trooper Nicholas Clark was a three-year veteran of the New York State Police. As a trooper, he started his career in Troop C before transferring home to Troop E, first to SP Auburn and then to SP Bath. Over the past week, I've learned that Nick had a true passion for life and that he was a natural leader. He was dependable, hardworking, humble, and kind. These are all crucial characteristics in being a great state trooper. Everyone has told me that public service was the perfect fit for Nick Clark. He was always helping others, steady, consistent, and with a great sense of humor and self. Nick wanted to be the best at whatever he put his mind to. And by his example, he also lifted those around him, pushing them to be the best that they could be. Nick graduated from the State Police Academy, and his willingness to help others became his life's work. Nick knew that he was where he could make a difference, and like everything else that he put his mind to, he was good at it. One of his academy classmates remembered that as she drove into work on her first day, she was terrified that she would not make it through the field training program. She also remembers that on the way in, she saw Nick and his field training officer out on a traffic stop, and he had already had somebody under arrest on day one. She remembers being jealous because it seemed that Nick picked up things so quickly. Many have told me that Nick often made things look easy. But I suspect that Nick made, look th made things look easy because he was smart, but also because he worked very hard at what he did. His fellow troopers said that when things looked like they might go bad, Nick is the guy that they wanted next to him. Whether he walked into an event, a party, or in our case, answered a call, he had that presence. You just knew things would be better when Nick showed up. Nicholas Clark was a state champion wrestler and an all-American football player. He was also a New York state trooper with a no-nonsense exterior. But his friends and coworkers would tell you he also had a huge heart. He loved hunting, fishing, and his dog, Rocky. Nick obviously loved sports, and we know that he loved being a New York State Trooper. 
but most of all, he loved his family. To all of Nick's friends and fellow troopers, I can tell you that nothing will ever be the same again. To Nick's family, I know that there is little we can say or do to ease your pain. For you, Nick's passing means missing the love and devotion of a caring son and brother. He reminds us how precious and fragile our lives truly are. I know firsthand that the pain and sorrow of our survivor families goes on. The New York State Police never forgets its fallen members or the families they leave behind. To Nick's family, I promise you, we will never leave you. His friends say that Nick was always their hero, the one who would always come to the rescue, the one who would always answer their call. Nick Clark answered our call on Sunday. His life was taken because he did what we asked him to do. He went into harm's way to protect the innocent. And despite the grave risk that he faced, he performed his duty to help others. That is a true hero. We can all learn from Nick Clark from the example that he set in his 29 years here. Never hesitate, challenge yourself, smile, laugh, live life to its fullest. May God bless Nick for his courage, his selflessness, his sacrifice, and for his service to others. We are blessed for having had him as a New York State Trooper. To Trooper Nicholas Clark, I stand with your friends, your colleagues, and with all New York State Troopers to say, Trooper Nicholas F. Clark, Shield 5528, end of watch, to July 2018. Rest in peace. Thank you, sir. Words well spoken from the heart. I know you have this in your bulletin, but I want to read the eulogy, and I've moved it around, so it's a little different than what you have there. But as I spoke to the family, they, they wanted, and I said, I'd love to do this. New York State Trooper Nicholas F. Clark, 29, passed away in the line of duty on Monday, July 2, 2018, in Irwin, New York. Nick was born September 18, 1988, in Wellsville to Anthony and Teresa Braestead Clark. He was predeceased by his maternal grandmother, Donna Braestead, in March of 2017. Nick is survived by his mother, Teresa, and her husband, Rick Gunn of Troopsburg, his father, Anthony, and his wife, Sandy Clark of Bath, a brother, Nathan, and his wife, Megan Clark, his maternal grandfather, George Braestead of Troopsburg in Florida, Paternal grandparents, Stephen and Linda Williamson, great-grandmother, Genevieve Williamson of all, all of Greenwood, his step-grandparents, Otis and Juanita Shoemaker of Rochester and Irene Middleton of Bath, his step-siblings, Ricky Joe Gunn of Corning, Stephen and Amanda Fuller, Sarah Fuller, all of Canisteo, Leah and Chad Pierce of Wayland, as well as nieces Cadence and Cambry Clark, Sierra Gunn, Lily, Reese, and Brooklyn Fuller, and Lincoln Fuller, and Maxon Pierce. Nick was a lifelong resident of the Canisteo Valley, and he graduated from the Canisteo Greenwood High School in 2006. He was a very gifted and stellar athlete, lettering in both football and wrestling, and was a straight uh, wrestling champ his senior year at the 189-pound division. He furthered his wrestling career by wrestling freestyle and Greco-Roman for the Apex Wrestling Club in Rochester for two years. After graduation, he enrolled at the University of North Carolina at Greensboro, where he studied marketing on a wrestling scholarship. 
In 2008, he transferred here to Alfred University, where he received his bachelor's degree in environmental studies in the summer of 2011. While he was here at Alfred, he was a four-year starter and an exceptional outside linebacker for the Alfred Saxons football team, where he set school records of tackle. He was named Empire 8 Conference All-Star from 2008 to 2011. From 2010 and 2011, the Conference Defensive Player of the Year and was further named American Football Coaches Association First Team All-American. Nick graduated from New York State Police Academy in 2015. He was stationed in Ithaca, Auburn, and eventually settled in Steuben County at the Bath Station. Nick was very much an outdoorsman who loved to golf. He loved hunting and fishing and spending time with his families and friends. And I discovered that his nieces would call him Uncle Nicky because they loved him so very much. Nick had that smile, and I need to tell you from knowing them, he had his mother's smile. Always that big, friendly smile. He was unselfish, he was dedicated to his profession, and we're gonna miss him deeply. He was admired and appreciated by everybody he came across. And you're right, we won't forget him. What an amazing, amazing young man for what he had done. I have one written eulogy that I would like to read now. I would like to say it was an honor to be friends with Nicholas Clark. I've known Nick and Nate since they started summer recreation in Canisteo in the 90s. I was a director, but I acted like a kid, participating in dodgeball, wiffle ball, and football with them. I moved to North Carolina in 1995 and returned to the Canisteo Valley in 2000. I read about Nick on the football field and wrestling, uh, Matt. The kid dominated all sports he was involved in, and that's very true. Nick and I reconnected after he was done at Alfred University. We started playing golf, hunted, and fished together. I knew Nick would be an unbelievable state trooper. I believe he scored 98 on a trooper test, and the process began. He was so excited, and I could not wait until I got out of the, he got out of the academy so we could spend time together. Nick completed the academy with a breeze. Everything came easy to him. His smile and drive was contagious. Nick was the guy you wanted next to you when things hit the fan. I loved every single second you spent with Carrie and I. You made life for everyone better that you touched. The Canisteo Valley, the New York State Police will never forget you, Nick. Rest in peace, God bless your family and friends, and I love you. And this is from Trooper Pete Peters of New York State Police, the Bath Division. This morning, I would like to share to you from the Word of God a message that he's given me. I worked and worked and worked on this, trying to make this as fitting as possible. And finally, I heard God sense in my life, he says, go with this. And this is from God to all of us that we can understand what's out there in life. I want to read to you from John chapter 11, verses 25 and 26, that says, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live, even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Then he asked this question, do you believe this? The other day, my wife was reading a, a little daily bread devotional that goes along with the Bible verse. And she said to me, let me read this to you, because I was working on this. And I had an illustration. But when she read that, I said, oh, no, I got to have this illustration. Listen to what it said. It was about a young girl by the name of Katie, and she was given a school assignment to write an essay entitled, My Perfect World. She begins, in my perfect world, ice cream is free, lollipops are everywhere, and the sky is blue all the time with only a few clouds that have interesting shapes. But then her essay turned to a more serious outlook. She said, in that world, no one will come home to bad news and no one will have to be the one to deliver it. That hit me like thunder. But friends, sadly, we don't live in that kind of a world, do we? Our world is full of broken people who need an answer to the problems that life faces every day. 
And I believe that no one knows that better than our brave law enforcement, people that I stand behind firmly. You face the dangers of life. Nick faced it, but he faced it as a brave state trooper, a hero. As Nick's family, to each of you as my friend, you are facing the darkest time of your life, a time that you never dreamed would happen. We know that death takes place, but to receive news like that is a crushing blow, almost like the walls are going to fall in on you. And all around us, our local communities, the state and the nations, we're reeling over the senseless death of Trooper Nicholas Clark as he was doing his duty, trying to help somebody, trying to make it right. But it was a tragic end for him. And it was like you have a small pond in front of you and somebody picked up a big rock and dropped it in the middle. You have concentric waves that reach out in every direction. And we have no idea of how many people this it, the event has touched. Only God knows that number. But when I saw those people coming through here yesterday, I saw their faces, I read their hearts, and they were people that loved dearly and respected this family. So we live in a broken world. I know that as a pastor, dealing with a lot of people. Terrible things happen to good people. Tragic things happen. So we ask ourselves, where did all of this start? Well, I'm going to take us on a little bit of a journey through Scripture and stop off at about three places. The Bible tells us in the book of Genesis that when God told Adam and Eve, the first two parents, they could have anything in the garden they wanted but to stay away from that one thing that we call the apple, which really wasn't an apple. It was a tree of knowledge of good and evil. And Satan, who was very real, tempted them, and they gave in, and they did exactly what they were not supposed to do, and they broke the relationship with God. God never broke it. They did. And the Bible calls that sin. And ever since that time, humanity has tried to do all kinds of, if you will, religious things to get themselves right with God and to get back into his good graces. Because, you see, we're never designed to be alienated from God. Never designed that way. But when people try these things, and you read history, they find they did all kinds of weird practices. But you see, friends, God doesn't want religion. He wants to have a personal relationship with us, every single one of us. And he made it possible by sending his only begotten son, Jesus Christ, to pay the price for our sin because it's impossible for you and I to do that on our own. You can't do it. I can't do it. And Jesus defeated death when he died on that cross at Calvary for you and me. No matter what you have done in your life, no matter how good or bad you think that you are or I am, we need a Savior, and that is Jesus Christ. Now we're going to go to our stop off here in John chapter 11, which I read to us, is the story of Lazarus and Martha and Mary. They were brothers and sisters, and they lived in a little town called Bethany, and Jesus was their very, very close friend. Lazarus has died. Everybody is grieving, and we understand all of that. And when Jesus shows up a couple of days later, Martha went out to meet him, and she said, if you'd have been here, my brother wouldn't have died. But then she goes on to say, but I know that whatever you ask of God, he will give it to you. See, in reality, she was pretty upset with Jesus because he didn't bother to show up when she wanted him to. We can get like that too. But yet he knew when he was supposed to show up. And he looked at her and he said, Lazarus will rise again. And she said, I know he will rise again in the resurrection of the dead. See, she knew something. She had something that everybody here and in this world has been, has been placed inside of them. It's called faith. Faith is that seed that God has born into all of us. And even people who I've come in contact with, well, I don't believe any of that. I said, one day you will. Stop and think about it. We just didn't appear. There's a purpose behind us. But she said that she knew one day by faith that she would see her brother again. So could, how could those words help Martha or ourselves today during this time of loss that you're experiencing? I want to go back to that verse again. Listen to what Jesus said. I am the resurrection and the life. 
The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. So the question is this, do you believe that? Jesus Christ, God's only begotten son, is our only guaranteed hope because he's in total control over life and death. How do I know that? Because God said it in the Bible. And you can't change that. His word is cast in concrete. And when we face things that we have no control over, such as, as death, and such as this senseless death today of, of a young brave hero, a young man that everybody loved, we can trust Jesus because he is the resurrection. He is the life. And he is our only hope of eternal life. And God wants us to remember one clear, unarguable truth. Only Jesus Christ came back from the dead to give us eternal life. Nobody else has ever done that. And he says, I have power over the death and the grave, and I can give you eternal life. See, when he came back, hundreds of people saw him. They walked with him. They talked with him. They ate with him, and they testified to the truth. And we find that it's not just found in the Bible, but in ancient history books, they've been recorded that. So when, Mar when Jesus said to Martha, those who believe in me will live even though they die, and whoever lives and believes in me will never die, what was he talking about? He was referring to eternal life after this present life is over for us. The Bible teaches that from the moment of conception, you and I are God's crowning creation made in his image. You can look that up in Psalm 139, and it describes it very clearly how we are knit in our mother's womb, and God has a plan for us. And because of sin, which is in part of us in our bloodstream, and we just can't say, well, we're going to do right and eradicate it. You can't do it. We're all going to die. And it comes to the young and the old, the rich and the poor, the educated and not so educated, the famous, the infamous, and just everyday people. Death comes to us. And absolutely, we want to leave a legacy. A year ago, this last February, my father died. And his last words to me as I sat on the bed next to him, he looked at me and right out of the blue, he says, Don, I'll see you there. And those were the last words that my father said to me. And a few days later, I laid my dad to rest. And my mom had gone, and my in-laws were gone, and now I'm kind of the oldest guy in the family. It's a strange feeling. But I will see you there. That stays with me. Sin, ladies and gentlemen, according to the Bible, God is breaking God's law. Romans 3.23 says, We have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But friends, God's grace is so amazing that it's freely offered to everyone. It's God's grace. God's riches at Christ's expense. God's son died for you and for me to free us from that bondage of sin and help us to walk with him and, and to continue to be in his image. Here's the great news. John 3, 16 and 17. A lot of people drop 17 off. This is important. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him will not perish, but will have everlasting life. For God did not send his son into the world that the world would be condemned, but the world would be saved through him. That is that amazing grace, ladies and gentlemen. When Jesus went to the cross and he shed his perfect sinless blood as the only sacrifice that God will accept for our sins. God's love and grace is extended to all of us. God's son died for you and me. Now in your mind, I want to take you on a little bit of a journey right now. And I want us to picture this event, which was true in history. We're leaving the city of Jerusalem. The crowds are in an uproar. And they're walking out and they're moving up on this hill. And it's called Calvary. And as we walk up that hill, as we get closer, we see three crosses up there. And the one in the middle, as we get closer, we find is Jesus, who was about to be crucified. And on either side of him were two common criminals. And as we begin to move into the conversation and we listen to them, this was recorded. The one criminal on his one side said, aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and us. 
See, he was mocking God. The other criminal said, don't you fear God? This man has done nothing wrong. You and I, we deserve to die. Then he turns to Jesus as he's hanging on the cross, and he looks at him, and he says, Jesus, remember me when you enter into your kingdom. And Jesus said, I tell you the truth. Today you will be with me in paradise, which is another term for heaven. He said today, that's an important word. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. You don't have to wait. There's not all this holding point. Immediately, who we are, the body dies, but we automatically are taken into God's presence. Again, no one is, is uh, perfect except for Jesus. And all of us are broken by sin in some way, and we need the Savior for forgiveness and to enter heaven. And he's the only one that can do that for us, the only one that can heal that brokenness. And you realize, of all of you in law enforcement and everybody that's here, if sin were to be totally wiped out right now, and it was gone, and everybody lived perfect, you'd be out of job. We wouldn't need lawyers or anybody. But let me tell you where that place is. It's heaven, because that's what it's going to be like. If we put our faith and trust in Jesus, when our death comes, and it will, we never die alone. We are ushered in to God's eternal presence. And when we're in heaven, it is a place that is perfect forever and ever and ever. And there are no tears, there's no sadness, there's no sorrow, there's no sin, and there's no death. And here's the good part. The Bible teaches that we will know one another as we once were here. We'll recognize each other. Only we'll be perfect. One day life will come to an end for each of us. We don't know when. We don't know how. We assume we have a good long life ahead of us. I can give you some very sad stories over my 32 years of over 360 funerals that were horrible and they break your heart. Life will come to an end for each of us. I remember one time in a message I had at church, I talked about this and I asked the people, I said, I'm gonna take a poll this morning. I said, how many of you would like to, if you had a choice, how many of you would like to die in a car accident? No hands. How many would like to die of a horribly dreaded disease? No way. How many of you would like to go to bed at night, close your eyes, and wake up in heaven? Hands were up all over the place. That's what we want, and that's what God offers to each of us. When you look to Jesus as the Savior of the world and ask him by faith to save you for an eternity, he will do it. In the Bible, Acts 4.12 says that salvation is found in no one else, for there's no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved except for Jesus Christ. Let's bow in prayer. Our Father, as I gave this message, I struggled with this whole thing. But I knew it was your word and I knew what you wanted. And I pray, Lord, for this family today. Oh, Lord, minister to their hearts. May you heal them. For each one of us that are here today, in all the great love and respect we have, may the message that you have given us from your word, through me as your messenger, be one that we would apply to our lives. May you bless each one now. Love them and extend your grace upon everybody, Father. And I pray this in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. At this time, I would ask that all law enforcement personnel would go outside for the departing formation, and all others would please remain seated. Thank you for your cooperation.
I was asked to announce that after the final resting place for Nathan or for Nick, we will have an invitation for everybody to go to the main place in Hornell. Uh, when we're ready to release, the first three rows of family will go first, and everybody please remain seated until the funeral director just explains it to you, okay? Thank you.
At ease, folks, at ease.
Tail present arms.